for over 150 years. Men have bruised and battled on fields like this. Fighting for inches, foot by foot, yard after yard, they go to war. And all for the glory of the game. Funny thing about glory, though. Doesn't last too long down here. Does it? <laughs> this life is barely a second in the scope of eternity. And eternity, well, that's an overtime game that's much harder to comprehend. But what if, what if we thought of it this way? What if we measured time by the length of this football field? The Bible tells us that to God, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Look, I don't have a math mind, but I do know football. So if we were to measure time by the length of this field, then this hundred yards, that would be a thousand years. The 50 yard line, that's 500 years. And right here, this is where we live our lives. First and 10 plus and minus a decade, day after day, living in the red zone. But in this eight, nine, 10 yards that we fought over every inch for, how do we know whether we're winning or we're losing? Well, thing is, God has quite a different way of measuring a yard, or a year, or even a thousand years. Because let's face it, what's it to him? Good morning. Good morning. How's this good looking crew doing? How are that bad looking crew doing? <laughs> How you doing? Good. All right, good, good. Good to have you here this morning. Um, you know, it's, it's like Super Bowl tonight, right? How many people are going to watch Super Bowl? <laughs> yeah, uh, besides Cindy, how many people are Chiefs fans? How many people are Eagles fans? How many people really don't care? <laughs> Just try to get, so I was thinking about, you know, Valentine's Day, guys, Valentine's Day is coming up Tuesday. Okay. That's your warning. Um, and I was thinking Valentine's Day, you know, Super Bowl, what do I kind of work this around? Probably neither, so we'll just. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a few years ago, Dan Plu has been working with uh, CFC kids for years, right? It was back when it was not only Man Eye Church. He'd been doing it for 25 years anyway or something like that. So he's been doing it for years, and so he, he gets these stories, and he talks to the kids, and he tells them about Jesus, and he, he was telling them about heaven one time, and believing in Jesus and going to heaven, and at the end of the talk, he said to the kids, where do you want to go? And the kids all said, heaven! He said, well, what do you have to be to get there? And one little boy just shouted, dead! <laughs> That's actually a story. It didn't really happen that way. I just, I just was using Dan on that. He does a good job. Uh, so I just want to say again, as a disclaimer for this series that I'm in, uh, this stuff is difficult. This stuff is, is challenging. Um, stuff is hard to understand sometimes um, and fully comprehend, and it's difficult to apply sometimes. Um, it's difficult to preach, but I know this. It has to be said. I know that it has to be preached. I know it has to be learned. I know we have to get this. And I'm trying to do, as I, as I go through this, I'm trying, as I sort all this out, I want you to know, without a question, that I'm relying on this as my textbook. I'm relying on the Bible as to get my information and be as faithful to that teaching as I can. Yeah, I read a lot of books. I read other things from other people. But I'll tell you this. When I read other things from other people, it's always, I always go back to the Bible see, are they taking this accurately? Are they, you know, rightly dividing the word of God, as Paul tells Timothy? So I'm working on that. Now, I have a question, have a question for you today. Is, and one question I have is, what does God want from you? 
You know, and that's kind of a question that we ask as believers, as followers of Jesus. God, what do you want from me? What do you expect from me? How do you, you know, and, and we can go to the Bible and learn how, and, get, and get kind of what he wants, but there's this personalization to it too, right? You know, um, and that's, that's a question that followers of Jesus, believers, have been asking themselves for many years. But here's one thing, and one of the greatest hindrances to knowing what God, God's will is through the scripture is that as we read them, many of us will read what we believe instead of believing what we read. Here's what I mean. We look at scripture through tainted glasses. Here is my ideals. Here's what I have come to believe, and, and, and I've come to believe this through various forms, through somebody's teaching maybe, or just a friend, or I've come to believe this because I just got to believe it that way, or I've come to believe it for this. And then when we read the Bible, and we read something else that goes contrary to what we've decided our, our, our belief system is set on, we just kind of skew that passage, say, well, it must be this, it must be that. Are you tracking with me? I mean, we, we kind of make it work this way. And reading what we believe happens when we read the God, when we read the Word of God through tainted lenses. Our vision gets tainted because of listening to other people. Our vision gets tainted because of, of uh, going to somebody else or listening or reading something else or coming across something else, YouTubing something else, whatever, and then not going back to the Scripture to see, is it right? We need to always check things with the Bible. What does the Bible say about this? You know, it doesn't matter what you've been taught by a denomination. It doesn't matter what you've been taught by a group of people. It doesn't matter what you've been taught by Tim Miller doesn't matter what other preconceived notions that we've developed through the years. You need to check it with the Word of God. Because the day's going to come when all of us give an account. And Gary doesn't get to say, well, Pastor Tim said. You know what I'm saying? We don't get to say, because the, the, the answer could be, I've given you my Word. Why didn't you check it out? So, you know, so I'm working on these, and it's, it, it, we, we, it's, it's so dangerous to just listen to anybody without checking out, because we can be deceived, deceived, and our core values, our core beliefs are off track. For example, let me take you back. Um, in the Old Testament, the ancient, there's an ancient book called Job. Some of you might have interpreted that as Job. I know, I know people have. Right, Dean? Dean? <laughs> Anyway, so Job, the story of Job, it starts out with in chapter 1 that, that um, um, Job was a, the most righteous man on all the earth. If you don't know the story, I'm going to quick give it to you quick. Righteous man on all the earth, and, and the de devil is running the earth, and God says, where you been? He says, yeah, I've been checking out the earth. He says, why don't you check out my servant Job? He's the most righteous man on the earth. And God, the devil says, ah, I don't think that. And basically, God's saying, I don't think you can handle Job. I think he's too much for you. So, so God gives the Satan permission to attack Job. And, and so what he does is he wipes everything out. Wipes his children out. Wipes his, all he owns out. Everything is wiped out. Completely gone. And except for Job and his wife. And, and so he's, Satan's back before the throne of God again. And he says, ah, you know, God says, what have you been doing? He says, I've been walking through the earth. And, and he said, well... What about Job? He said, well, you know, but your, your hand is for him. I mean, you surely won't let me touch him. I mean, Job, God finally says, okay, you can touch him, but just don't kill him. So Job, so God, or Satan gives boils on Job. His affects his body to the point of Job breaks potter and he's scraping it. And he is, now this guy, you got to understand, this guy was the most righteous man in the world at that time, and he had... He was wealthy, he had everything, his kids were doing good, everything's going great, and then, boom, one day it's gone. Imagine that for a second. And then you've got boils all over your body, and you're, you're in pain, you're in misery, you're in agony. So Job has friends who come to console him, and the friends come, they sit around the campfire, that's what I think anyway. Four friends, the first three are telling their Job what they think. They're giving him counsel, and they're talking about it to Job, and, and Job's replying to them. Each of them does three different set speeches. 
The fourth friend, he doesn't say anything. He's the youngest. He's deferring to the older people because they're supposed to be wiser. But the fourth friend, Elihu, the Beuzite, he says something. When it's his turn to talk, he says something to Job. Job is lamenting. He says, I haven't done a thing. I haven't done a stinking thing. What's going on here? Elihu says this. Must God tailor his justice to your demands? Don't you think about that. Think about the times that you put demands on God. Think about the times that you felt like God was not justified in what he was doing or allowing in your life. Think about those moments and ask yourself, am I asking God to tailor his justice to fit my demands? Sometimes when we read the scripture, we want to do that, right? God, you need to fit my demands the way I think it should be. We don't really say that, but that's kind of what's going on, right? This young friend is absolutely right on. And we see it today, and too many Christians do it today. We allow our experiences to interpret God's word rather than allowing God's word to establish the truth. And when we do this, we wind up hiding the truth from other people who are trying to come to know the truth. Going on, then Job finally comes face to face with the Almighty. It takes 42 chapters, but he gets there. God doesn't say anything for 42 chapters. Pretty amazing. God shows up. Job says this. In the past, I knew only what others had told me. But now, I have seen you with my own eyes. In the past, I knew what my friends told me. I knew what other people told me. I knew that. But now I see you, and I see you differently from what I learned, from what I got. And this is what we need. We are changed as we have the interactive relationship with a holy, just creator of the world. And beholding him, as Paul says, changed from glory to glory, not as we hear about him. Having, an, having a relationship with the Almighty, knowing for sure what he says in his word, because it's confirmed in the spirit in what I'm doing with him, spending my time with him. People, when the eyes of our heart are enlightened, as Paul says in Corinthians, at that moment we are enlightened and changed to become more and more like Jesus. And people, I'm going to tell you, that's what it's about. It's not about conforming to this or conforming. It's about becoming more like Jesus today, right? We want you to be more like Jesus today than you were yesterday or last year. So open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Here we go. That was my introduction. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, your Bible is your electronic equivalent, your, your notes, whatever you got there. Open. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's telling them, he's teaching them about using the narrow gate. He's talking to them about watching out for false prophets. He's talking to them about the need to be fruit inspectors. You know, you'll know the people who they really are because you're judging them by the fruit that they bear, right? So we're supposed to be fruit inspectors. So, so he goes on, verse 22, he says this. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, the New American Standard and the New King James Version uh, says this, and I like this. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, in, the, in, the, in the, the word lawlessness, the Greek word for lawlessness is iniquity, which means to violate the law, which means you're a sinner, basically. So that's what the word lawlessness or evildoers here means, not being submitted to God's authority. When you're sinning, you're going against God. You're not submitted to his authority, right? Because I'm rebelling. I'm going against him. I'm sinning. I'm doing what he doesn't want me to do. I'm going against that. So I'm not submitting to his, lo his lo loyalty. So, and notice also that it uses the word practice. Practice. And that, mean, that means what practice tells us that we're not talking about young Christians. We're not talking about new believers. We're talking about people, people who are, um, who've are been Christians for some time and and, and we're not even talking about somebody who stumbles from time to time, but we're talking about somebody who just keeps doing this. A person who's living diametrically opposed to the will of God. When you think of practice, I think of uh, an attorney practices. 
He's a practicing attorney. I think of a doctor who's a practicing physician. They, no offense, doctors in here, but you haven't got it right, so you're still practicing. Right? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but, you know, they're practicing. That means it's what we're doing, right? And we're getting. So Jesus is talking about people who are deluded, who are deceived, people who are unfaithful. Then he, says to me, then he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, now here, here, there's another group of people we're talking about. So we're talking about those who are practicing, they're diametrically opposed to God. Now we're talking about those who have turned away from the kingdom of God. And notice there are people who prophesy, people who drive out demons, people who perform miracles. You know, they do many things in the name of Jesus. Didn't we do this in your name, in Jesus' name, right? Flip over in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9, if you would. Acts chapter 19, excuse me. I'm going to give you a for instance. A for instance. So, so for instance, there's a family of Jews... In Acts chapter 19, um, actually I'm not going to get into a lot of scripture on that, but just so you know, there's a family of Jews, and they have a father who's a chief priest, and from, he's, his name is Sceva. And he has seven sons, and they're going from town to town, and they're trying to cast demons out of people. And, and so they're going from town to town, and they're casting these evil spirits out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And they come to this one town, and they tried to cast an evil spirit out of a man, but the spirit said in verse 15, I know Jesus, and I've heard about Paul, but I don't know you. And at that moment, that demon comes out and gives this, this priest and his seven sons a good old whooping. Right? He just lays it on them, he lays them out, and they're gone. It was impossible for these these exorcists to cast out a demon in the name of Jesus. The question is, why? Why? See, to cast a demon out, is not en- it's not enough to use the name of Jesus, but you have to have a relationship with Jesus. You can't just go around using his name. You've got you to gotta know, because the demon said, I know Jesus, and I've heard about Paul, but I haven't got a clue who you are. They didn't have a relationship with Jesus. You have to be a follower of Jesus, a believer, a Christian. Now, taking Matthew 7 into account here, you might think, wait a minute, Jesus said he never knew these people who were doing this very thing, who were casting out demons, doing miracles. So how does, it, how does this wash? How, does that, how can that be? How, how does that work? Listen, there are a lot of people who genuinely take Jesus to be their savior so they can have fire insurance. There's a lot of people who don't want to go to hell, right? I'll take Jesus. I'll make him my savior. I'm, I don't want to go to hell. I want to stay away from that, you know. But there's another part of that. They're doing this because it's good for them, right? And it's good. It's good to take Jesus as your savior so you don't go to hell. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I, I'm, with, I'm with God on this one, you know. He, I don't want anybody to do this. But the thing is, they're not making him Lord of their life. There's a lot of people who make Jesus their Savior, but they don't make him Lord. What does it mean to make somebody Lord? It means that they have authority. It means they have rule. They govern how you're living. They govern what you're doing. They never make him Lord, and they never know his heart. They don't have a relationship, but they only want the power and the blessing. And on that day, Jesus will not know those who don't have a relationship with him. You say to me, Lord, Lord, but I never knew you. You know, you can know about somebody, but knowing them intimately is another story. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8, 3, but if anyone loves God, he is known by him. I like the way the Amplified Version puts this. But if one loves God, truly, that's with affection, reverence, prompt obedience, grateful recognition of his blessings, 
He is known by God that's recognized as worthy of his intimacy and love. He is, he is owned by him. Jesus will say to many on the judgment day, I never knew you. I never knew you. So the people who don't love God, as I just described, are not known intimately by the Father or Jesus. Even if they say they've come for salvation because they don't really have the relationship. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people who come to the altar and in revival meetings all over the world. But it's an emotional response. The relationship isn't there. Loving Jesus means giving up your life for him. Galatians 2.20, I love this verse. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's how it finishes out. A really good example, I think, would be Judas. Have you thought about this? Here's a man who follows Jesus for three and a half years. By all appearances, he was a disciple. It looked like he loved Jesus. He was with him, sat around his campfire for three and a half years. He was under the heat of persecution. Even when a lot of the followers of Jesus left, he stayed. According to Luke 9.1, Judas even cast out demons, healed the sick, proclaimed the kingdom of God. But Judas' heart wasn't right from the start. He lied to Jesus' face. He took money for the ministry for a personal use. The list goes on. And because he never knew Jesus intimately, Jesus said, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. Now he met Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. We see people today who are a lot like Judas. People who sacrifice for the ministry. They set people free from oppression. They set people free to heal others. They preach the gospel. They trust Jesus for salvation, but never intimately know the Savior. The work is for selfish ambition, not the love of God. Here's the condemnation for those people. Possibly the greatest condemnation is Matthew 26, 23. Jesus says, he who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not even been born. And for those people, you think, wow, I've him, you're... You know, stepping on toes. And I just want to be clear, I'm not trying to step on any toes. I'm always trying to step on hearts. So I'm sorry if I'm stepping on your toes. I want to hit your heart. But there's also people like me, people in ministry leadership. People like your elders, pastors all over. For those of us who are church leaders, I am very aware of Hebrews 13, 17. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them. For Why? Because they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. I take that very seriously. Because one day I'm going to stand before the Lord myself, and I will have to give an account for what I'm teaching, for what I'm preaching, how I lead the ministry, what we do. When religious leaders serve God for personal gain and take advantage of people, we will, as Matthew first say, receive a greater condemnation as part of the woes, seven woes he gave the Pharisees. We have a dog, Sadie. She loves to play fetch. Throw the frisbee, she goes and gets it. We throw the frisbee, and she brings it back, and we do this. And every now and then, actually it's happening more often than not sometimes, Sadie, I'll throw the frisbee, and she'll go out and get that, and all of a sudden, her nose catches something. Ever, anybody ever do this? And she goes trotting off to something, checking something out, and she kind of forgets, and she comes running back to me, but she doesn't have the Frisbee. So I have to say, Sadie, go get your Frisbee. And she takes off to get it again, and her nose catches something else. And she goes looking, and she, she just kind of wanders off, and 
and sometimes I wind up getting the frisbee. So, it's not, so we're kind of done at that at, at that point. It's hard to get her back on track. I just talked of those people who never had a relationship with Jesus. But what about the people who are doing like Sadie? Heading out for that and then drift. Drift off. Something else catches their nose. They drift off. Let's take a look. Ezekiel eighteen twenty four. God says, but when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, that's sin, and does according to all the abomination that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. Did you know that was in the Bible? Because, why? Because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed. Because of them, he shall die. Now, you might think, well, Tim, that's the Old Testament. Wait a Isn't God the same yesterday, today, and forever? So we've got we to figure this out. God's talking about a righteous man, right? He's not talking about or somebody on the street. He's talking about a righteous man. That's someone who thought they were righteous but never was. And what's God say? He says that he will not remember any of his righteousness because of that sin. One of the good things that we followers of Jesus have going for us, we like it when we, we know the passage that God forgets our sins, right? He, 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 he forgets our sins like as though they never happened. He forgets your sins as far as the east is from the west. You heard that before? And you know why it's east and from west, not north and south? Because if you can go east, you keep going east. You never go west. If you, get, if you go north, you'll eventually come back south. Anyway, so, just, I'll just let you think about that. I'm not charging extra for that. Okay. So, you know, we, we like those passages. And, 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 in fact, Hebrews 8, 12 tells us this. I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Love that passage. God forgets our sins. As soon as you say yes to Jesus Christ, you repent from your ways, and you turn to follow him, and you take Jesus to be Savior and Lord, he forgets your sins. He puts it under the blood of Jesus. And that's good news, right? We like that. That's good news. But when Satan, and when Satan tries to accuse us of anything, like what we did in our B.C. days, you know what, you know what B.C. days is? Before Christ days? Okay. When Satan comes to you and he accuses you of stuff that you did before your B.C. days, God goes, hmm, I don't remember that one. Unfortunately, Jesus is going, besides, I got it covered. In God's mind, it's though those things had never happened. But the opposite is also true. When God says in Ezekiel that a person's righteousness will not be remembered, he means that he will forget he ever knew the person. So what does the Bible, not other people, not the church, not a denomination, not, a, not Tim Miller, not another pastor, what does the Bible say about a believer that permanently drifts away from their salvation? And some flat just walk away. Can they? Here's where it gets a little hairy. There's various theological views, and there's a lot of great theological scholars that have different views on this. Let's go to James chapter 5. New Testament, toward the back of your Bible. James says this. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders, drifts from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, I want you to notice that he's talking to the church and he says, brethren, if any among you, he's talking to the church. He's not talking to people who are outside the church. He's talking to the believers. He's talking about people who believe but drift away, but, but wander away from the faith. And we can see here that a brother who drifts away is called a sinner. Right? 
Does this mean that this person is no longer born again? No. What he's talking about here is a person who is, who is in, um, he's talking about a person who just drifts away, but you have somebody who can bring him back. But I'm going to just say this. If there's a person who is in habitual sin and needs to return to being an obedient follower of Jesus, what I mean by habitual sin, the person who says, I'm done. I'm done with Jesus. I'm done with the faith. I'm not going, I'm done with this stuff. Or it says, you know the word of God says I shouldn't be doing this, but I don't care, I'm going to keep doing it. Willful defiance, open rebellion. If that person keeps on his drifting ways, James spells out what the end result will be. It's death to the soul. If there's no, no turning back to God, if there's no repentance, he, he said you can't, it, the person is gone. Proverbs 21, 16 tells us this. A man who strays from the path of understanding comes to rest in the company of the dead. And that agrees with James saying about the person drifting from away in the ways of God, from the ways of God, and doesn't turn back to righteousness. So just so you know, I believe that a person can walk away from their salvation. I don't believe anybody can take you away from salvation. I believe it's a personal choice. I believe that, that if we say that you cannot walk away from your salvation, then you no, more, no longer have free will. The Bible teaches us about free will. Satan walked away from his salvation. Lucifer and a third of all the angels in heaven chose to leave because they, Lucifer says, I am going to be better than God. I am God. This passage here agrees with what James says about a person drifting from the ways of God and doesn't turn back to righteousness, will end up in the company of the dead, which we learned last week is Hades and eventually the Lake of Fire. I'm going to finish this message up next week, and I'll look at the book of life and those who, do, who depart from the faith and what that has to say. But for now, I want you to understand something. I want, you, I want to be abundantly clear here this morning. If you have asked Jesus Christ into your heart, and with all sincerity, if you said, Jesus, come save me, I'm no good the way I am. And you're making him Lord of your life. Yeah, you're going to stumble. How many know we stumble, we fall? But you, you get up, brush the dust off and say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry I did that. I'm going to follow you as best I can. And you turn from the way you're headed and you go back to the Lord. If you have done that, I want you to understand. If you've given your life to surrender to him, I want you to understand you are saved. You have a name written in the book of life. I want you to leave here with the assurance of salvation if you have done that. It's a guarantee for those who love Jesus. It is a guarantee. I'm going to tell you what. We're talking about eternity here. In eternity, it's a very, very long time.